One of the other challenges facing Martian chefs will be the air pressure. Now, any Martian habitat is going to be pressurized, but given the amount of resources it takes to pressurize that atmosphere, it probably won't be pressurized to the level of Earth sea level. Instead, it'll probably be more similar to high altitude climates with slightly lower air pressure. And some chefs, like Jay Rifle, say that while this may present a bit of a learning curve, it won't actually be that much harder to cook in. I'm Jay Rifle. I'm the executive chef at Edible History. Edible History is a food project that brings history to life through creating original recipes from original documentation. The basic issue, um, more than anything else, is that water boils at a lower temperature, at, at a higher altitude. Not, you know, which can be sig significant. Also, your expansion rate of gases, so things like the amount of gas that comes out of your soda or, or the amount of gas that's released by a leavening agent in ba baking um, increases kind of dramatically. But then again, your gravitational forces are lower. I'm actually going to bet for some funny reasons that this is not going to be that big a deal. And the reason is, I think you have to think about it a different way. I think if you're going to talk about cooking on Mars, you should first think, like, what are the actual cooking techniques you're going to use? And I'm going to bet they're going to fall into three categories for this reason. Oxygen is at a premium, right? So you are probably not ever going to burn anything to create heat. Like, you're not going to, like, use a gas flame for anything you know um, you're probably do everything on induction or possibly microwave but like induction is like really really efficient way of being very similar to a, a modern stove you know but also you probably want to control your environment a whole lot so I'm guessing you're not going to be boiling a pot of soup on a stove you're probably either going to be cooking stuff sous vide with a you know very small amount of water water again is at a huge premium even you know, if you're talking about an underground base that's protected from radiation with a couple thousand colonists, water is still at a real premium. I mean, you're still spending a lot of energy like recycling your urine. So you don't want to be like throwing that into the atmosphere and having to spend a lot of energy to reclaim it. So I'm guessing you're either going to be stealing ingredients in a bag, placing them in a water or other substrate, it could be oil, it could be any reusable substrate, um, and heating them to a very specific temperature for a very specific time, which is actually you know, what we do in fancy restaurants these days, and it's a really, really efficient way. Or, and this is why I think stuff like the lower boiling point is less of a problem. I suspect you'd be a lot of stuff would be done in pressure cookers because you absolutely control the amount of liquid. You can very accurately control the amount of heat. And, you know, you don't have to now, you know, you crack a pressure cooker, vents that steam into the atmosphere. Why would you do that? You just vent it back into a tank. But what about foods that rely on the release of gases, like yeast breads? Will the change in atmospheric pressure affect the way those cook? That is a super interesting question, which I've actually given some thought to. The real question in my mind is, what is the strongest forces you may be dealing with is just the elasticity of the gluten, you know, the structural integrity of, of, of the gluten that's holding your stuff together. I am going to guess that a competent bread baker who worked on Mars today would not have that much of a trouble. And the reason is a good bread baker does so much by feel because, you know, the atmosphere changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Even the flowers that you get change in their hydration levels, which is why, like, uh, I had a chef friend who uh, came from New York and uh, moved, he was pastry chef, and he moved to uh, Nevada to work at a hotel. And he said none of his recipes worked for a month because Ooh. the because the hydration levels of the the of the flour he was using was so different. So therefore the weights were different. And so if you work, you know, we try to do everything, oh, we're so smart, we're doing anything in grams. Well, grams don't translate well if you're going from a very wet environment where the hydration level of the bread is higher or the actual flour to like a very, very dry environment, like the middle of Nevada. But the thing is, on breads, you do it, you really do it by poking, you know, you kind of touch your little babies and like the way that they spring back, the way that, you know, so that's, that's such a big part of, of like the rising process. You probably notice, oh, wow, everything's going really fast because 
the gas, if, if you're in a lower, um, a lower pressure environment, the, the gas bubbles would actually have, have more force to expand, um, whereas the elasticity of the gluten would remain the same. So I, I'm guessing you could probably just be like, oh, that's, that feels about right. Throw it in the oven. I mean, I think things that are very that are very delicately leavened, like souffles and stuff, you're looking for a very specific stuff. And in terms of in terms of things that can overproof, so when you when you put too much leavening in, or you let bread overproof, or you put too much leavening in, say, a cake, right? The gas bubbles that are making it raise, right, become too large, and they either hit each other and make larger bubbles or they burst or both and your cake ends up falling. You often find that, you know, cake is like dead in the middle kind of scalloped out. Um, and that's because it's risen too high and then fallen. That would initially be a big problem for trying to make, you know, a meringue and, you know, a souffle or, you know, whipping, even whipping cream, which would probably be a little bit easier. Although there's some weird structural things about whipped cream that I once read a long article about because I'm really that kind of guy. However, I think in the long run, gravity is kind of your friend, particularly, and I'm saying this as a pastry chef, among other things, who like, likes to build zany stuff. So, you know, you're often fighting with gravity when you're trying to build kind of an architectural sculpture out of food, something I've done entirely too much of, you know, so I think in that sense, it would be really good. Oh, probably tons of different ways. Um, if we're if we're still thinking about cooking, just thinking about I mentioned the bowl I mentioned the bowl of soup, right? If you you know the soup will still fall, but you can do a magic trick and like pull the bowl out of the way and kind of see the soup fall back into it. Liquids would be really splashy. All the li all liquids would splash more on on Mars. It would probably be really fun, actually, like in a, like swimming in a pool because three times less gravity. The water is going to go three times as high. It's going to splash three times as far. It's going to take three times as long to fall. So you can imagine having a lot of fun with a water slide. Um, and you can also imagine making a complete mess if you tried to eat soup. Also flipping pancakes, not a liquid, but you'd have to be careful how, you'd have to be careful how high you tossed it because it, because a, a normal toss will throw it three times as high. So be careful how you flip your pancakes. Probably well, can't get the ketchup out of the, out of the ketchup thing. That brings us to the third category, everybody's favorite, eating. I think it would be, I think stuff like that would be tricky. To have a regular meal would be tricky at first because it's not a zero gravity environment, but things are not going to, you know, are not gonna behave the way you're expecting them to. When it comes to tasting food, there are two major components. One is the food itself, and two is you, your body, and it turns out that the environment your body is in can actually make a big difference on the way it processes inputs, like taste. Take, for example, airplanes. Airplane food tastes awful, right? It always has. No matter which airline you're on, it always tastes a little bit like cardboard. Airlines realized that people were complaining about the food, and in the last few decades, they decided to do something about it by funding multiple different research projects. Turns out there are three environmental factors on planes that are affecting the way your body processes taste. Air pressure, humidity, and noise level. I'm Jason Murray. I'm a resident in pathology at Hopkins. I finished med school at Hopkins. Uh, before that, did a PhD in structural biology at Cambridge, looking at uh, ribosomes and translation complexes using electron microscopes. And before that, uh, my undergrad was in chemical engineering and biochemistry from Georgia Tech. Uh, the short answer is we don't know how it has an effect, but we know that it does have an effect. So studies on humans tasting things at uh, essentially different elevations, which affects the atmospheric pressure that they experience, as well as different humidity levels and things like that, uh, definitely plays a role in how humans uh, experience taste, which is actually a combination of like the experience of taste that you have when you eat something is a combination of the taste buds on your tongue, uh, the smell going in through your nose, as well as actually the, uh, the physical experience of the food in your mouth. So all of that uh, combines together to create the sensation of 
you know, kind of taste and that enjoyment of food that happens when you eat. To be honest, we don't know. Uh, a lot of the research has been focused on uh, what people experience and not, a little bit less on why. Uh, a lot of this research is coming from the airline industry because people, you know, early in uh, air travel, people had, you know, complained about food, you know, tasting like crap. And uh, on the ground, it tasted fine. But then it's when, when you get up to altitude, uh, you're obviously not experiencing what it's like to be at 30 or 35,000 feet when you're flying. Uh, but most airline cabins are pressurized to between eight and 9,000 feet. Um, so it's a a lot of people live at sea level, and then all of a sudden, if you're going up to a mile and a half, two miles high, that change in atmospheric pressure affects the way that you experience taste. Interestingly, the five different flavor groups, salty, sweet, sour, savory, and bitter, don't seem to be equally affected by this. Now, we don't yet know if this is because of the placement of taste buds on your tongue or something else, but we do know that environmental factors affect each one of these groups differently. And yes, you're right the research has shown that certain areas of taste seem to be more affected than others. Um, the sensitivity that you have and kind of the threshold for salt, sugar, uh, umame or glutamate, those thresholds seem to increase uh, when you go up in altitude, so at a lower pressure, which would mean that you mean, need more of those in order to get the same experience. Uh, you need more of, you know, salt, sugar, or glutamate in order to, you know, have that same sort of taste that you would on the ground. Um, sour is a little bit uh, hit or miss, depending on what research you look at. Some of them say that that threshold goes up, some say it goes down. So that one's still, the, the jury's a little bit out. Um, interestingly, kind of the, the bitterness taste doesn't really seem to be affected by uh, atmospheric pressure and the effect of elevation that you're at. So something that has a, uh, you know, a certain level of bitterness on the ground, that the research shows that that wouldn't really change going up to altitude. So that would become a more, compared to some of these other tastes, that would become more dominant and thus throw off the balance of food as a whole. And so if in planning for eating a meal that's at effectively higher altitude, that needs to be planned for and compensated for. there seems to be some role of the actual neural connections and how they integrate in the brain. Um, the, the different sensor, uh, sensory cells in the tongue, in the nose, all actually go to, they obviously because they start in different physical locations, they take different paths into the brain. But there's a, uh, a small center, which we call uh, in medicine cortexes, where different types of signals come together and are integrated. And that seems to function a bit differently at higher altitude uh, than at sea level. And we're still figuring out how or why that happens. Some of the sensation, the initial registration of the sense itself, not only is affected, it seems to be affected by pressure, but also by humidity. Um, so when you think about it, the, um, the way that food is sensed or taste, uh, tasted, um, you have chemicals in the food that need to somehow interact with the taste buds on your tongue or the uh, smell sensors in your nose. And that is that has to be done by some sort of chemical binding to something. And that typically will happen through, you know, it something is dissolved or comes out of the food, binds that taste sensor. Um, air, uh, airplane cabins are typically kept at a very low relative humidity. Uh, comparable to what you would experience in uh, a desert environment compared to a much higher humi humidity that you get you know, on the ground at sea level um, where a lot of people live. So you're decreasing the ability of, you're decreasing the amount of humidity, you're decreasing the moisture content of a lot of things, including the various you know, sensory membranes of your uh, mouth and nose. Just like most people have experienced on a really cold day, they lose the ability to smell some, you know, it feels like the inside, you know, it's a really cold, you try and breathe through your nose, you know, everything just kind of tightens up because you're just, you're changing the way that uh, the moisture behaves in your nose and in your mouth. That seems to also be playing a role in how we uh, sense food. Other things that people experience in airplanes and would likely experience in an artificial environment like on Mars is actually sound and the way external uh, sound influences the way that people perceive taste as well. 
um, and sorry, this is where I was, yes. Um, essentially, again, not fully understood, it's thought to have some interact, somewhat related to just the ability, the body's ability to be processing multiple streams of information at once, as well as some of the, some of the musculature actually involved in hearing originally comes from, at an embryologic level, the muscles involved in chewing. It's thought that might play some role, um, but there's actually some studies showing that white noise, uh, exposing people to white noise or not when they eat, causes them to have a higher uh, threshold and thus you need more sweet and maybe sour in order to get the same experience of taste, whereas there's not a change for bitter or salty foods. Now, you may have noticed that all three of those airplane factors, pressure, humidity, and noise, are also going to be present in the Martian habitat. So, does that mean that all Mars food is going to taste like airplane food? How can we mitigate those factors so that Martian food actually tastes good? It either have to be food itself or, you know, some big advances in noise-canceling headphones. <laughs> it might. It might. All of your senses interact in some way or another. And again, this is, you know, you know it ha it's not an area that's fantastically well studied, but there does seem to be an interplay between kind of noise, uh, ambient noise, and the experience of, say, of taste within certain of the five aspects of taste. Um, and again, something that will need to be looked at in terms of, you know, long-term habitation. But despite all the challenges, food on Mars gives us the opportunity to create dishes that literally could not exist on this planet. Whether it's creating huge pastry towers that don't have to fight gravity in order to stand up, or growing crops that are bigger than anything we could produce on this planet, there are tons of possibilities here that we've only just begun to tap. So if you could create any food on Mars, what would it be? I'd be curious because uh, there are lots of plants that are like endemic to certain places uh, and obviously this would be for funsies to see if you get like sort of crossbreed plants that normally wouldn't be able to live together um, because they're living in different conditions. Uh, so like you have your dry, arid, and cool plants that are usually found on mountains in the, uh, not in the United States, but in the world um, and then maybe crossing it with some potential fruit and maybe getting a different fruit. I don't know. I mean, the, the limits are, <laughs> there are no limits here. Uh, so maybe we can start getting, uh, I, I really enjoy like the things like, uh, what do they call like plumac plumacrots or aperplums or <laughs> you know, like, like they like cross these different fruit together. It'd be interesting to see if you could start getting like different types of fruit and, and foods in Martian soil or Martian atmosphere because of the conditions being different. I think that would be really neat. Actually, this is actually something I should do anyway. Someone should make like a crook of Michigan live in. I could totally build one. Just take a week. Well, a couple weeks. But yes, so that, that's something I would do. You know, I would love to bring back crazy 19th century jellies and make giant molds of them, you know, and they would wiggle and slowly undulate in the low gravity. That'd be pretty satisfying. All of this is just scratching the surface of what it means to farm, cook, and eat on Mars. And if you'd like to follow me as I delve deeper into topics like designing the Martian kitchen or pollinating crops without insects, you can follow along at MartianStreetFoodSociety.com or you can follow me at Martian Street Food Society on YouTube. And if you'd like to know more about my Earth-centric food projects, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at EatThePast. I want to give a huge thank you to all of the experts who took the time to talk to me for this opening episode. And if you want to reach out to them, I'm about to put their contact information on the screen, so get ready to screenshot. If you are an expert about any topic that you think might be relevant to the Martian Street Food Society, please reach out. I would love to work with you. You can find my contact information on the website.